further ado, let's go on and get into that video. How's it going you guys? It's Scott with Everyday Home Repairs and I want to approach a very common topic that many of us homeowners are going to have to deal with in the near future. As we start to add electric car charging, solar panels, power walls, we start to max out our electrical panels and now we need to make more space. Now before you just start stabbing a bunch of wires and breakers, I'm going to bring in my friend Joel Walsman from Jefferson Electric out of Indianapolis, Indiana, one of the best in the business to walk us through how to do this safely and to code. So if you're a homeowner, frustrated or confused about how to add circuits to your panel, let me show you how to do it. In fact, I've seen many home inspectors wrongly call out breaker code violations. So let me address that as well. And how Okay, so first off, um, I really don't think homeowners should be doing any work anyway in their panel. Uh, you know what, if you feel like you've got the skills to do it, go for it. Otherwise, call a licensed electrician to, to do that. Um, but I do like that he's wearing eye protection and he's wearing gloves. Uh, and that's a good point. If you are going to attempt your own electrical or anything like that, make sure you have the proper protection on. You don't know what could shoot out if you had an arc into your eye. Uh, and of course, you want to make sure you wear gloves. You know, you don't want too big of gloves. Then you feel kind of clumsy and you get kind of could drop something and that's not good in a panel. Even since you're going to cut the power off to this because it looks like there's no main breaker on this. So there's a chance that there's an exterior panel uh, service disconnect somewhere outside. Um, you still want to attack it like it's uh, alive, especially if you're a homeowner. Now, if you hire a professional, uh, they're going to know all the rules that they need to do to stay safe. But again, I want you to be aware that it is wearing go uh, goggles, wearing gloves, uh, ready to get the job done. So let's, uh, let's let him get to it. How you can overcome that challenge. In this case, we've got a 200 amp disconnect on the exterior of the home. Make sure you turn off main power so you safely remove your electrical panel cover. All right, so this is a remote distribution panel. Obviously, the service disconnect is outside. Um, if you're in the 2020 edition of the National Electrical Code or even the 2023 that just came out, um, you have a rule under 230.85 for one and two family dwellings to have an exterior emergency disconnection means. Uh, other places in the country have been doing this for years. Uh, I don't know where this person is, so it could be under the 2020 or it could be under the 2023, but I don't think anybody's adopted that yet. So chances are it's under the 2020, or it could just be a part of the country where that's pretty common for them to put the exterior disconnect to service disconnect outside in order to be able to extend a feeder further into the building. Cause you can't take service conductors throughout the building, but you can take feeders because they're protected on a supply side. So uh, I'm gonna assume that this is done under 2020 code and he's got an exterior service disconnect. If you wanna look at your code book, it's 230.85, go check that out. Now one little trick for you is I'm using my left elbow to secure the electrical panel cover with pressure while I'm removing this last screw. What I don't wanna do is drop my cover and damage it or knock off a bunch of breakers. I wanna remove it in a controlled fashion just like that, rocking it off the surface. All right, so one of the things you want to remember also is when you do take that panel away, you don't know what could be touching in there. You don't know if those screws that you put in, you know, hope they use the right screws. You don't know if it was somebody used sheet box screws, which they should not use, sheet metal screws, which they should not use. You have to use blunt tip screws. Um, but anyway, they could have used something and when you're pulling it off, it could have cut through the conductors that are in there. You notice they're all along the side. Uh, and then when it comes back off, maybe it didn't cut it all the way through when they screwed it in, but maybe when he unscrews it out, now it cuts all the way through and now you got a conductive uh, surface on that insulated conductor that's exposed and it now could cause an arc or something. So anyway, you use that cover as a blast shield as you pull it away from the actual panel itself. And if things going to arc, you've got the panel cover between you and the panel board. Okay. So I think he did that. So it's good to go. But again, he's got all his protection. So he's rocking it out as we would expect him to. 
First, let's go over assessing our situation. A lot of electrical panels are not labeled or are incorrectly labeled. Next, we're gonna go over your three options for combining circuits, and this does depend on the brand of panel you have, and some of this, even pros don't know. And finally, we're gonna do it. I have four circuits, I'm gonna combine down to two on this Eaton panel, because this homeowner is getting some massive upgrades and needs more space. I'm excited now because I'm an electrician for over 30 years and he's going to teach me something new. I'm excited. Are you excited? All right. He's going to show us stuff that even the pros don't know. So let's see. Assessing. First, my go-to always for combining circuits is lighting loads. Old incandescent lighting loads were 10 times heavier than modern LED loads. So when you're looking for lightly loaded circuits to bring together, LED lights and lighting circuits are the first key. What do you do if you don't have any lighting circuits? Look for other lightly loaded circuits. In this case, I've got smoke detectors, which are dedicated. So those are actually smoke alarms, but we know what he's talking about. Um, there is nothing in the code that requires smoke alarms to be on a circuit by themselves. Now, in some jurisdictions around the country, they might want them to be on with the kitchen lighting so that if the power goes off with the lights in the kitchen, then that sends a message to the homeowner that that the chances are that obviously the smoke alarms won't be working either, right? So it's kind of a kind of a process that they have, and that's based on that jurisdiction. But there's nothing written in the code about that. Uh, it's also very frequent to run a single branch circuit and put all the smoke alarms on that and loop them together, and then end it in a box up in the attic. And that's just a spare circuit because smoke alarms have very little load capacity on them. So they don't pull a lot. So it's another way to get that spare circuit. But if you do have a dedicated circuit for that, for some reason in that panel, definitely an opportunity to use that circuit. Uh, one of the other things that I typically do here, and, and I don't know whether he'll talk about this or not, is when I go in to a house like this, when I was adding circuits to an existing panel, I would turn on various loads and uh, turn on all the lights uh, and plug different things in the receptacles so that I could go in that panel with an amp probe and I would click an amp probe on there and I'd take some readings. And I'm looking for circuits that are very light when I see that the general use. Now, try to pick areas that you know would get a lot of use and test those and see what the capacity is of those. Um, Bedrooms and things like that usually pull very little, whereas media rooms and living rooms and family gathering locations might pull more on those circuits. So look for what would be the obvious uh, if they had spare rooms, spare bedrooms, things like that. Click those amp probes on, see what you're getting. Uh, obviously, if you have no loads plugged in the receptacles, you're not going to have any loads there, but make sure you turn your lighting on. But do your due diligence and look for the, the lightest loaded circuits you can. And that's what he's done here. He's identified them up front. Uh, do not do this with circuits that you know are going to be critical, like sump pumps and things like that. Okay, Leave those be. Look for those other lightly loaded circuits. And, and he's absolutely right. If you've got LED lighting, uh, then that's a good place to start uh, because that is today very low wattage, 13 watts, 16 watts, 18 watts. It's nothing like the 100 watts that we used to get with the incandescents. So again, that is the low hanging fruit when it looks to finding those lightly loaded circuits to be able to add something to it. But are not required to be dedicated by code in this jurisdiction. Check with your local standards. And Photocell Bedroom 3. So it tells me there are a few exterior lights on with bedroom three. I'll be combining those into a circuit. Things to stay away from, sub pumps, furnaces, kitchens, and bathrooms. You want those circuits to be strong, and in fact, by code, they're required. Check out National Electrical Code Article 210.50 and 52 for detailed explanation on that. So, 210.52 is more about the receptacle spacing and, and, and how you run them around the room. Of course, 210.52 has an A, that's your general provisions. They have a B, uh, dealing with small appliances. C, talks about placements in kitchens, countertops, and things like that. So, yeah, that's your holy grail for placements and receptacles. 
electrical requirements and things like that. The lighting falls under 210.70, but again, right there in that 210 for brand circuits is where you're going to get all the meat and potatoes when it comes to the lighting load requirements, the receptacle load requirements, and all that. So absolutely. Uh, remember, dot 52, which is a section, the article is 210. That's going to be primarily a residentially driven section. Uh, but it's a real important one for you to learn uh, because it talks about things like the six foot, 12 foot rule, the two foot, four foot rules for the countertops and kitchens. All of that type of stuff is right there in uh, section 52 of article 210. So very much make sure you check those out. Option one, and I'm going to show you this, so stick around, is using a pigtail properly sized to your circuit and a WAGO 221 lever nut. Least intimidating option if you're a homeowner. If you've got a Square D panel, unlike my Eaton brand panel, Square D panels allow for two conductors per breaker in some common instances. That's both home line and Square D QO. Yeah, so be careful. Um, if you have the home line, usually you have a saddle that's like this in the screen. And you'll notice that the saddle rests over each of the conductors. The one thing to remember that if you're going to do 14 through 10 and you're going to use two conductors per termination here uh, in those saddles, you want to make sure that you're not mixing it up, right? And obviously the breaker, if it's rated 15 amps, you can only use 14 gauge, right? So you want to make sure that if you're going to bring two 14 gauges to that breaker, that that's what you do. You don't accidentally take a 14 and a 12. Even if you were doing for voltage drop and it was still a 15 amp circuit, but you were increasing the size of the conductor to 12 gauge for whatever reason, the code allows you to do that. You want to make sure that you're not putting a 14 and a 12 under the same terminal like this. And even though this is rated for two conductors from sizes 14 to 10, you don't want to intermix it. So you can use two 14s, two 12s, two 10s, but you cannot have a 14 and a 12, a 12 and a 10, things like that. It says it right on there, pretty clear. If you're using one conductor for the saddle, then it allows you to go all the way from 14 all the way up to eight gauge because you don't have to worry about the other side of the saddle. So again, pay attention to this. This is square D, this is a home line. If you're looking at the CH, uh, they don't have the saddles for the most part. They have little Vs and so the conductors fit down nicely. But again, make sure you check the breaker. Don't assume that it's rated for more than one conductor. Always check to make sure, okay? Important thing to remember. Also, one thing I'll talk about, and we'll see whether he's gonna do this or not. See what it says on the side of that breaker? So many people forget this because they just use regular screwdrivers. And you know what? I get it. But you notice that that is in inch pounds, not foot pounds, inch pounds. There's a difference, okay? So 36 inch pounds is what the torquing requirement is for that circuit breaker. Now, only way you're going to achieve that is with a torquing tool, right? And they're very inexpensive. I recommend you pick one up. They work just like a screwdriver. Uh, but when you're making these critical terminations, uh, it's really important because over torquing is just as bad as under torquing when it comes to the termination. Okay. Arcing can take place if you over torque it, then you compress the material, and then when it relaxes a little bit or goes through some load cycling, then what can happen is it can loosen a little bit because you over torqued it, and then when it relaxes back on the termination, creates a bit of an arc as current's drawn through the device. Now, that can happen if you under torque it as well, create a loose connection and it just sits there. And when loads being drawn, if it doesn't have a good metal to metal contact, it will arc across it if it's in close proximity. That arc creates heat and over time it can raise that heat up to a point where it causes that plastic breaker to melt down and, and break down. So it's so important to torque things. It's so understated. It's not talked about a lot. Um, People act like it's an inconvenience to have a torquing tool. I've got a torquing tool. I've used a torquing tool for year, years. It, it doesn't take very long, and they're very inexpensive. Now, you do you. I'm just saying. It's very clear what this device has to be torqued at. Okay? Let's see if he does it. But I get it. Paul's just being a little anal. I understand. But let's just see. Now, if you've got a square D panel and you've been called out by a home inspector, they blanket that. That's always called out. However, if you need to prove it and support what you've just done in the panel, you go to the manufacturer's website, 
pull the data sheet, and there in the data sheet, it will list the number and size of conductors that that breaker is rated for. Now the third one is the part I see a lot of pros getting wrong, and its use of piggyback is the nickname, or tandem breakers in an electrical panel like this to create additional circuit space. And I'll show you the violations and issues that I come across there. So here's option one, with the panel and the breakers off, using a number two square drive screwdriver to loosen the terminations. Well, it's obvious he's not going to use a torquing screwdriver. So again, you do you, but technically that is a violation because uh, you could over Now, in aluminum conductors, it is even more of an issue because it's softer material. Obviously, these are brand circuits, uh, but the softer material, the more the torquing, the more the potential damage to the actual conductor. So again, uh, you'd be surprised. Do some tests. Get your torquing screwdriver and tighten something down to what you think is a certain number of inch pounds, right? And then use a torquing tool set at the proper inch pounds and see how close you got. I think you might be shocked. Um, but he's going to do him and he's going to tighten it down. And again, I'm not going to say that I've never done it without a torquing device. Y'all know that'd be BS. Uh, but in the last 15 years, it's been pretty much the mainstay of any of the work that I've done. I have a torquing screwdriver. I have a torquing wrench. Uh, so it just becomes natural practice for me now. Uh, but again, you have to get used to that. So again, otherwise you're going to grab your screwdriver and just tighten that bad boy down. But again, just want you to be aware, over torquing or over tightening can be just as bad as under tightening. From there, I'm going to use my Wago and pigtail. It's a 14 gauge pigtail because it's a 15 amp circuit. Well, some people don't like these. Now, there's two different types. There's the lever type, and then there's the ones with the spring. You push them in just like you do back wire on a receptacle, for example. Um, the people that seem to like these love the lever style. The people that seem to hate these things are the ones that don't like to push in. Uh, in fact, people don't like the fact that you can push in the back of certain receptacles, 15 gauge, for example. Um, 14 gauge, 15 amp, I should say. Um, People don't like to backwire those, although they've been evaluated, they've been listed, they're designed for it, but people still don't like it. They seem to like these levers better, um, but again, you also see there are wire nuts in this panel, and that you could have done instead of using these. If you don't like these, then this method also works with wire nuts as well. Okay? Just make sure that your wire nut is designed to hold the number of conductors you're going to be putting in it. Don't just try to cram them in there and crank it down. The package of four wire nuts will tell you how many of certain gauges can go into a wire nut. So keep that in mind. Matches. I'm going to remove my conductors and slip them under the Wago. Give a tug test to make sure they're fully seated. And also, I don't want any exposed conductor here, so I'm happy with that. If you've never seen a Wago before, check out the link in the description. Scott's Amazon store, there's going to be starter kits there with two port, three port Wago lever nuts to get you going on them. Only comment I'll make also about these is you notice when he put them in there, if you pause the video and you go back, you'll notice that it compressed the copper. And it can compress it as much as 70, 80 percent. Uh, it really, well, not 80 percent. Yeah, 80 percent of the original. So 50 being half of it, 80 percent being 20 uh, percent less than its original size or diameter. Anyway, the point being is I personally, before I put them on these Wagos, um, one of the tips that I would do is cut off that piece that has been compressed and start with a fresh. Okay, because if you look at it, it is fairly crushed down. It's OK if it's under a lug. Uh, and it's going to stay that way because you torque it properly. But if you're pulling it loose and you're using the Wago like that, my advice is just cut off that little piece of compressed copper, go with the fresh piece, put it in the Wago, and go to town. That's what my recommendation would be. But again, you do you. But again, it's I'd rather get rid of that connection because I want to make sure that in that Wago, that lever style, that I've got good contact from the conductor to the internal mechanism. I'm just saying. 
I'm going to bring my pigtail in, land it on the breaker using my number square, two square drive, I'm going to tighten it down. You don't want to over tighten it, just snug. Approximately 15 inch pounds. Now we've got an available breaker. The breaker. Okay, so he says approximately 15 inch pounds. Well, we saw what the rating was on the side of the breaker. So uh, kind of discard that statement. Um, I believe it was 36 uh, inch pounds. Um, so he's just making a general statement. I get it. Uh, and he's not torquing it anyway, so it wouldn't matter. But um, again, sometimes when you watch videos on the internet, uh, take it for a little grain of salt. Do your own due diligence. Make sure you know the torquing values for the breaker. 36 uh, inch pounds is pretty common for circuit breakers, but each manufacturer might be slightly different. Uh, so he just made a statement. But again, this is why it pays to have a torquing screwdriver. They're not expensive. And it's not an inconvenience. It works the same as a screwdriver. Just, I'm just saying. Just gets rocked out of place. If it's too tight to do that, sometimes you can use a little extra leverage with a flathead screwdriver to get it started. Now, if you're adding a 240 volt double pull breaker, you might need to reshuffle the deck once your circuit combinations are complete to get two spaces side by side. Make sure you update your panel labels to maintain currency. If you're just going to keep this open for future use, make sure that you need to put a panel KO closer in place to protect accidental contact with live parts when you're done. Third option is using tandem or piggyback breakers. And I'm going to drop two more nuggets that pros don't know right at the end. So let me... So real quick about these tandem breakers. Um, those tandem breakers are, uh, you can only use those in panels that allow tandem breakers. Uh, panels that allow a certain number of them in their panel will have a design built into the bus that's going to limit the ability for you to put that tandem in there. And it's going to be designed into the bus itself so that the breaker won't go in. So if you've ever looked at a panel, what you want to do is if you're going to use a tandem, provided your panel will allow you. So don't assume go out and buy some tandems and you because your panel's full and you think you can just jam it in there. So, again, a 40 circuit panel is designed to hold 40 circuits, not 42 circuits, not 44 circuits. OK, so keep that a 42 circuit panel would hold 42 circuits. Every single breaker counts as one circuit. Every two pole counts as two and every three pole counts as three. So again, when you're adding up the numbers, that's how it goes. So just adding tandems anywhere you want, it's not gonna work. A panel is designed to accept tandems, will have it in the legend. And so it will show you where you could put these tandems. And so he's gonna show you all about that now. So I, I, I'm sure he's gonna show you. Let me show you something about electrical panels. Check this out. This component back here is called the bus. And the bus is dissimilar as it goes down. It actually transitions. There is a point at which it does not allow for tandem piggyback breakers. You can see the separation where tandem breakers are allowed. That notch indicates approved. And the lack of notching there, disapproved. So one of the aspects about these breakers that when you have a situation where you can use tandems in a panel and it's uh, more of the modern panels allow it, um, what you want to be aware of is that they're usually circuit limiting. It means it's designed this way to limit the number of circuits that can be installed in this panel. So they're going to allow you to use these tandems at certain locations with the intent that you're not going to exceed the number of circuits that this panel is rated for. Okay. So, again, as you can see here, and it's a really good picture there below his shaft of his screwdriver where you have the notch. So these are circuit limiting bus means that you can use uh, regular breakers up to a certain point and then they would let you use tandems at a certain point down. You, sometimes the last uh, five spaces, things like that. Again, check with your panel. Just don't go out and see a panel in your garage. It's full and immediately think, oh, I need another circuit. I'm just going to put a tandem in there. Right. Make sure you look at the legend on the cover, if there is one, and if not, 
try to get the model from it and go to the manufacturer's website and see whether or not uh, that panel is designed to handle tandems. So again, you just can't put them anywhere, right? Approved, disapproved. So inserting this Eaton breaker into any slot in the bus other than the bottom five on either side is a violation of the National Electrical Code because it's a violation of this panel's manufacturing, listing, and labeling. So that is UL67 for a panel board. So it's circuit, circuit limiting panel board uh, because this one obviously allows the five spaces at the bottom to be used with tandems. So um, again, his statement to the standard, it's just UL67 for that panel board. Incidentally, when you look at that picture right there, the guts in the middle is the actual panel board. The outer part where all the wiring goes around it, that is the cabinet or the enclosure. We typically would call that the cabinet and the panel board actually mounts, we call it the guts, inside of the actual cabinet itself, in case you wanted to know. So up here what you get, if you try to jam the piggyback breaker in, is, oh, oh, can't do it without field modifications which is a violation. Down lower, in the bottom five slots, the piggyback fits. Combining circuits is so common. At least 50% of the jobs we do because of the ever-increasing power demands in a home. One of those components that I think every home will have in the next 10 years is called a smart panel. If you want to know what it costs, how to do it, and some killer features, check out this video here and thanks for joining us today catch you on the next one guys okay so let's think about this follow-up so you can do splices perfectly fine he liked to use wagos again i'd cut off the little piece that's compressed copper that came from the breaker that's what i recommend uh, but anyway, you can use that. You can use wire nuts, perfectly fine. Just make sure the wire nut is designed to handle the number of conductors and the sizes that you're going to use with it. Okay, no brainer there. Um, you can use, um, if, if the breakers that are in there itself allow for two conductors, then you can put two conductors of the same size on the breaker, just make sure you look at the breaker. If you contact the manufacturer, whether you're using home line, or CH brand for Eaton or Square D's home line. Uh, I guess they call theirs home line as well. I'm not sure what they call theirs. Anyway, it's the BR series. Uh, or if you're using the, um, the Square D's higher line, that type of thing, So, which is called the QO. Uh, just make sure you check it to see, because again, not all breakers can handle multiple conductors. It'll be right there on the side of the breaker, but the manufacturer will be able to give you the literature for that. So don't assume it. Now, if the breaker does allow you to do multiple conductors on it, again, make sure they're of the same size. Don't do a 14 and a 12, okay? Don't do a 10 and a 12, okay? Again, you wanna make sure you're sizing for the overcurrent device, uh, but again, you don't want to mix, mismatch that. You want 14s and a 14, a 12 and a 12, or a 10 and a 10. Uh, you don't want to have the different sizes on the same lug because it's impossible for the torquing or the compression to go onto one conductor properly. So if it was a 12 and a 14, it might tighten onto the 12, but it will not adequately tighten onto the 14. You can create an arc condition. So just keep those things in mind and you have no problems. Uh, and yes, you can have splices in a panel, again, as shown here. Um, and of course, if you wanna know how many splices you can have at a panel, what's the cross-sectional area and all that kind of good stuff, and you wanna know more about things that are violations of code, then check out our Fast Tracks program on our website at electricalcodeacademy.com. You can check it out. And uh, we have all types of courses on residential, commercial, industrial, grounding and bonding, electrical theory. If you're preparing for an electrical exam, you want the most popular program out there on the market. It's called the Fast Tracks Black or the Fast Tracks Plus. They will teach you the National Electrical Code. All right, folks, hope you got something out of this video. Till next time, stay safe. I give the guy out of five stars, I give him five stars. He did a good job.
All right, folks, take care.